So please share your screen and introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the, the invitation. I'm extremely happy to, to be here uh, to talk about uh, physics in the, in the context of uh, African um, uh, research and, and also uh, the, the, the needs um, that are uh, connected to energy conversion and storage. So um, can, you sh can you see my screen uh, at this point? Can you see it or not? Yeah, we see it. So please make it a full and then we can go ahead. Excellent, excellent. So um, my name is uh, Ismail Adabo and I'm an associate professor at Penn State University. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how we can use data-driven, uh, that is computational material discovery, in order to uh, address some of the questions associated with the production of energy. And I'm going to talk specifically today about the uh, production of hydrogen as a fuel from uh, solar energy. And uh, before I jump into the bulk of this uh, uh, research, I, I would very much like to uh, thank uh, the organizers of this African Physical Society Conference. And I very much hope that this conference will continue to grow and uh, attract uh, young researcher and uh, experienced researcher, and that this will uh, ultimately uh, become a, a, an important um, uh, area where ideas can be shared uh, in the area of physics and, and other connected areas such as material science. So before I, uh, I go and describe more about this computational work, I'd like to uh, step back a moment and just tell you uh, my background. So my family is from Guinea and I did my uh, undergraduate studies in France at Ecole Polytechnique. Then I, I moved to the US uh, in Massachusetts uh, to do my, my PhD, where I saw an opportunity to apply computational material research in order to solve important challenges related to energy conversion and storage. And I think th this has a lot of potential, especially for um, countries around the world and in particular uh, in, in Africa. Uh, what I would like to uh, uh, do today is to tell you about my work uh, at Penn State University, that is uh, a, a state you, you may have heard recently because of the US election. It was a swing, swing state and there has been a lot of uh, discussion in the news. And, and so um, uh, I work at Penn State where uh, I have a group that dedicates uh, its activities to the use of computer simulations in order to accelerate the discovery of new materials. So the, the context of this is, um, uh, from a broad picture point of view, is uh, the issue of uh, providing uh, consumption um, um, transportation fuel for a growing world population. And I have here a, um, a graph that shows the consumption, the global consumption of fuel uh, as a function of time. And you can see that there are essentially two uh, main contributors. There's a great contribution that comes from light duty vehicles that as you can see uh, is uh, progressively being stabilized. And this is thanks to progress in efficiency and also uh, the appearance recently, the emergence of hybrid vehicle and plug-in electric vehicles. And thanks to that, uh, the, the consumption of fuel uh, for the light duty fleet is actually uh, quite stable. But you can see also that there is a blue contribution here that keeps increasing over time. And this is the contribution from heavy duty transportation uh, vehicles, such as those heavy duty trucks, for which we don't have currently hybrid and electric alternative. And because of that, the consumption keeps increasing. And this means that for the foreseeable future, we will need to continue to produce a fuel for this heavy duty fleet. So, one uh, option to alleviate this uh, challenge is to use fuel cells. You might have heard recently about the Toyota Mirai. So Mirai in Japanese means future. And so this is what Toyota thinks could be a significant contributor to the future of transportation. It's a, a fuel cell vehicle that uses hydrogen as a fuel instead of uh, conventional fossil fuels. And uh, the, the, the benefit of hydrogen are multifold. First of all, it's uh, extremely friendly environmentally. So the only byproduct of the use of hydrogen is wa wa water vapor. So it means that when you drive this car, you don't have any other emission than, than water. And also uh, it is extremely efficient in terms of 
um, energy efficiency, it is about twice as efficient as a uh, conventional uh, internal combustion uh, system. But the bad, uh, uh, maybe the, the less advantageous aspect of using hydrogen is that hydrogen is very expensive. So I've here the typical price of one gallon of gasoline in the US, about $2.5 per gallon. And if you have to translate that in terms of hydrogen, the hydrogen is actually six to seven times more expensive than, than gasoline. And so this makes it a, a very uh, economically uh, problematic uh, option uh, for um, transportation. Another uh, important aspect is that conventional hydrogen is often derived from methane reforming, which produces carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide has all of the negative uh, um, environmental impact climatic impact that we, that we know. And so uh, as a result, it's uh, important to develop alternative ways to produce hydrogen that will reduce this cost and avoid the production of CO2. One option to do so is uh, uh, photocatalytic water splitting or artificial photosynthesis. You have here uh, two uh, concepts uh, to be able to produce hydrogen based on artificial photosynthesis. The first one is a single bed particle suspension. So I save you the details, but you have essentially uh, two plastic bags, and you see the dimension of this plastic bag here, that contain a suspension of uh, particles that can catalyze on one side the catalytic reduction of water into hydrogen and the catalytic oxidation of water into oxygen. And by this process, you uh, will be able to produce uh, uh, H2. There's another concept in which you separate the two reactions and, uh, but the concept is essentially the same, that you will absorb solar light, put water uh, uh, in, uh, in, in those bags with a suspension of particles, and at the end of the day, you produce hydrogen. So in that way, you can use water and sunlight to uh, power uh, your, your, your fuel cell car. So you don't need to extract resources from the ground. You can transform water, split it, and obtain hydrogen. So there has been a, a very uh, comprehensive and very detailed uh, technical economic analysis published in Energy and Environmental uh, Science, which is one of the leading journals uh, in the field of energy uh, these days. And uh, in this journal, they uh, made an estimation that if we were to use the first type of technology, and if we were to achieve particles and materials that can achieve uh, STH efficiency of 10%, so STH means solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency of 10%, we will be able uh, to reduce the price of production of hydrogen to two to $4 per uh, gallon gasoline equivalent. This means that at that point, we will be competitive with uh, um, uh, petroleum-based fuel, and we will be able to power uh, the transportation uh, fleet uh, sustainably, and, and we can uh, alleviate the needs to uh, extract more resources from the ground to produce a fuel. So what we wanted to do is uh, um, to address this question. Can we develop materials that can reach an efficiency of 10%? And for that, we will rely on uh, high throughput computational material discovery. So this is an important evolution in the field of uh, material science, whereby uh, we have now uh, computational methods that are uh, extremely uh, efficient and also predictive that enable you to predict the properties of materials before they are synthesized experimentally. And those are based on solving the equations of uh, quantum mechanics, the, the Schrodinger equation. But the bottom line is that uh, there has been a lot of activities in different fields, such as battery uh, research, development of solar cells, development of thermoelectric devices, photocatalytic materials, like uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, today, uh, piezoelectric, dielectric. And so using computers, we can uh, rapidly screen tens of thousands of materials uh, very quickly and be able to determine whether or not there will be good candidates for a specific application. But as you can see from this graph, there has been a lot of activity, but few of those um, uh, computational high throughput searches have been associated with experimental validation. So as you can see, only about 20% in, in all range of those computational studies have been associated with uh, experimental validations. So we wanted to use those type of techniques, but to address this problem of how you can validate experimentally uh, your prediction 
and how you can achieve this uh, cross communication between theory and experiments. So this is the protocol that we have developed in collaboration with uh, people at uh, Cornell University, the group of Tito Abunia, uh, Craig Finney and at Penn State, uh, the group of Venkat Gopalan and um, um, Reshak, as well as the National Rural Renewable Energy Lab, uh, where uh, you can see that um, essentially we use computers to first predict the chemical stability of the compounds. Then we look at the solar absorption. So we can also predict that computationally, at which point uh, we are interested in knowing if the uh, band alignment is correct, meaning that the exiting energy of an electron from the semiconductor will be higher than the entering energy of an electron in uh, water. And the same for the hole, you want the exiting energy of a hole from uh, your semiconductor to be lower than the entering energy of a hole uh, in uh, the, the, the water solvent in order to produce uh, oxygen. So um, uh, then once we have done that completely, we can look at the toxicity of the material. We want to make sure that this is environmentally and uh, um, uh, from a health point of view safe. Then we uh, want to make sure that this is earth abundant, that we're not going to look at very expensive materials such as gold or platinum, uh, because that will be not economically viable. At which point we are going to synthesize, uh, to check the synthesizability of the material, whether it can be made. And for that, we go in the literature. And for each candidate, we look if there exists a reference that explains how to synthesize the material. If it is the case, we go to the next step, where we uh, apply refined um, computational methods that are called uh, DFT uh, plus U, that is completely ab initio. Uh, and does not require experimental data that enables you to predict better band gap. So these at the beginning were coarse calculations, very quick calculation. And here we do the very refined calculation at which point we can check the phase purity of the material. And then the last step is to check for the photocatalytic activity of the material. And based on what we have learned from this cross validation between theory and experiment, we go back to the beginning and we can uh, again screen more material. So it's a cyclic approach that enables you uh, ultimately to narrow down the choice of interesting materials. So I'm uh, going to uh, just summarize uh, in, in uh, one picture how uh, this goes uh, uh, in, from a quantitative point of view. So we started from 70,000 compounds that are listed in the materials project and the inorganic uh, crystal uh, structure database. And uh, we uh, first calculate the enthalpy of formation in the computer, and you check that this enthalpy is uh, exothermic, meaning that uh, it is energetically favorable to uh, make those compounds, and that will be stable. Then we use uh, uh, our quick estimate of the band gap, epsilon g, to make sure that uh, we are within a, a range that will be reasonable. Then uh, what we do, we check that the uh, valence band and the conduction band of the semiconductor uh, are suitable for water splitting. Again, using uh, a quick estimate, uh, the, the, the calculation that do not require the most extensive uh, um, iterations. Then we uh, want to make sure that the lethal dose of the material, the LD50 uh, coefficient, is greater than 250 milligram per kilogram. So uh, essentially, it is less toxic than lead. And then uh, we want to make sure that it's earth abundant, it can be synthesized. And here we apply the refined uh, DFT plus U calculations that enable us to uh, have an accurate prediction of the bent edges. And at this point, we do the, uh, we check the uh, purity of the sample and uh, we can test the 14 material that we have. So essentially 70,000 and uh, we uh, narrow down the choice to 14 interesting materials as the first cycle of this iteration. And you can repeat this iteration based on what you have learned at each step of the, of, of the screening. So now, uh, quickly the results. Um, so these are the uh, materials that were made by our colleagues. Um, and these are band gap measurements uh, obtained by a talk analysis. And you see that for most of the compound, we have a pretty clear uh, signature of the band gap except for some of them where we can have mixed oxidation state and uh, uh, mid gap states that may affect the determination of the band gap. But essentially uh, here we are fairly confident about the band gap that we can measure 
except maybe for those few materials. Uh, we then uh, compare those to um, experimental band gap computational prediction. So you see, um, there are essentially two families of materials. The blue ones that are uh, um, open, uh, closed shell materials that are not magnetic, for which we, we tend to do quite well in predicting the band gap within 0.5 or one electron volt. Uh, but you can see for magnetic material, we, we don't do as well. And this is something that we have learned as part of this cross validation that probably uh, non-magnetic material uh, are uh, under control, but we need to do more work in order to uh, describe the magnetic structure of other materials. Uh, here are uh, the um, uh, mod shock key measurement that we did at the National Renewable Energy Lab. They have unique facilities to be able to uh, determine experimentally the, the band edges. So you see in orange what they obtained. And in blue are simulations. So you can see that we, we have fairly good agreement between uh, the two sets, except maybe for calcium indate and this uh, magnesium antimonate. And this might be due to the appearance of surface state. So I will not go too much into that, but essentially, we uh, are quite happy about the result that we obtain, and we uh, feel we understand some of the limitation of the, of the method again. So again, uh, very important uh, cross-validation between experiment and theory. So then uh, uh, our colleagues at Penn State develop a very sensitive gas chromatography setup to detect hydrogen. Uh, essentially, you want to be able to purge your chamber uh, between each test, and you want to be uh, very sealed, so they develop a very um, uh, advanced uh, gas chromatography analysis uh, capability for that purpose. And this project would not have been possible without their contribution and this important setup. So these are the results. So uh, among the nine materials that uh, are described, the non-magnetic materials, we uh, indeed found hydrogen production at the end for uh, many of those. So you can see that for seven of the nine materials, we have hydrogen production. And for the other material, we don't see hydrogen production. And this is expected because um, uh, some of them, you see that th there is a shift in the bent edges that I've shown previously uh, that is poten potentially due to surface co corrosion. And this might be one of the explanations why we don't see hydrogen. But we were very excited actually by those results that were very much the result of a collaborative research between uh, different universities and uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. And uh, we feel that this could be uh, an important uh, contribution uh, a, a meaningful contribution to the search of new photocatalysts. And so we're doing more work on, in this uh, um, area and we have submitted this paper in energy and environmental science. It's under review uh, and uh, we hope that it will appear soon there. Um, so, you have so one you, minute. Yeah, so with that, I would like to, to thank you. So thank you very much for uh, attending. So I, I hope I gave you uh, a sense of how we can use computer simulations uh, that are accessible uh, in particular through the ICTP uh, uh, Institute uh, that uh, really enable you to make prediction and to accelerate the discovery of new materials. And I feel that this is an important frontier for the future of material science. And, and, I, and I think I feel that it can be an important opportunity for uh, institutions uh, uh, across the continent. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to, to thank the people without whom this work would not have been uh, possible, uh, the students. So you, you see, it's a very uh, collaborative work involving Penn State, EPFL, Cornell University, Kyushu University in Japan. And uh, we acknowledge funding from the DOE, from the NSF. And these are the brilliant students who did the, all the work. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer uh, your questions. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Ali, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Ismaili. It's good, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so uh, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, you know, have you thought, I'm sure you have, about uh, this connection between um, this data-driven approaches? Mm -hmm. Can this be reversed engineered uh, to, you know, create like a, a universal DFT functional that will fix and be the holy grail of everything? So that's, that's the first one. The second one was related to some of the band gaps that you showed um, comparing theory and experiment. Um, you know, one thing that's consistently different between the theory and experiment is that you have this red edge, uh, this tail to lower energies in the experiment mm -hmm. that's missing. It, so is this because of impurities? Is it from, uh, because of phonons? Or what, where does this come from? 
Yeah, no, very, very good question. So to answer your, your question, so uh, because of the time constraint, I didn't go too much into the details of the theory, but I do have a slide here that uh, essentially compares uh, some of the uh, calculation that you'll find in the literature and the calculation that we do here. So um, uh, we apply um, um, computational techniques that uh, try to better describe the interaction between the electrons in order to understand the, um, their excitation where they are under illumination. So you can mm -hmm. see here, the typical DFT calculation will be in blue and our calculations are in gray. So you see that we, we tend to do better, not always, but we mm -hmm. tend to do better. Sometimes the materials are predicted to be metallic. We do predict them to be semiconducting. So, uh, and, and this is uh, uh, an important validation of the technique and it motivates us to further look into that uh, those methods to, to develop better functionals mm -hmm. uh, okay. gaps. Regarding the, 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 the experiment versus theory, so we uh, indeed, um, those states are due to mid-gap states, impurities in the materials, mm -hmm. uh, as you can see here. And this is uh, something that we discuss more specifically in this paper. So we, we go into the question of why those materials develop mid-gap state. And uh, uh, definitely, this is the frontier of what we can do here. It would be uh, extremely valuable to be able to anticipate the production, the formation of mid-gap state. And that's so certainly something that not, I would be, yes. It's, it's not because of um, uh, uh, distortions of the lattice or anything, not because of phonons. Like, vi how does, how does thermal, thermal vibrations can also, of course, create some broadening in spectra? So. Yeah, absolutely. This can be predicted as well. Uh, all the vibronic effects on the spectra is something that can be predicted. We do, uh, we are interested in electron phonon coupling, especially in the context of thermoelectric. So this is another topic uh -huh. I didn't talk about today. Uh, but yet yeah, nowadays, uh, there could be fairly uh, good and reliable um, prediction of electron phonon coupling and their effect on, uh, on spectroscopic properties. Um, okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, it's only a frontier. At this okay, point. got it, thanks. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, great. So I'm encouraging the students to ask. I mean, it's a platform where you need to ask even if you think it's a stupid question, it's not a stupid in the end of the day. So go ahead and ask. And, and I would like to mention if there are students, uh, um, we are very much interested in having uh, some of the top students applying to yeah. Penn State. Um, so I'll be happy to discuss offline as well. Uh, okay, Penn great. State. Okay, great. So if we don't have any more questions, then we can move on yeah, to the... Hold on. The uh, time is already over. <laughs> it is. Okay, okay, okay. Fine, fine, fine. Thank you. So yeah, so, you, so can, you, can, you can discuss offline. So we are just going to move to the, to the uh, last talk, which we 